taking the two distinct subjects um, might appear odd, but there are, of course, some links between the two, as Colin just rightly pointed out. Um, the, there's a link between Brexit and Trump historically, politically, in that they are perhaps both part of the same populist right nationalist movement in a way, and used many of the same techniques, of course, in the referendum campaign as, was used, as were used in the USA during Trump's original election, the, the social media and other techniques. There are links in that much of the EU is currently convinced that Johnson doesn't want to close a deal with the EU until he knows the result of the US presidential elections. Um, that's a very widespread view in other European countries. Um, there are general links that the, shall we say, the populist right in certain countries in Europe, Hungary, Poland, Slovenia, and certain parties in other countries um, will be slightly at least slightly, hopefully more, deflated if Trump loses power. We don't know for sure, but it's not, if he were re-elected, it would be a boost to them. And if he's not re-elected, it's not a boost to them. So there are connections between the US presidential election results and, and the situation in Europe. But in coming though to the negotiations, which were supposed to have been concluded already, I expect when you fixed this date, we were all expecting them to have been <laughs> concluded already. Um, they're not. And why are they not? Is it because of the issues at stake in those negotiations? Or is it because of divisions within the Conservative Party about what they actually want as an outcome? could be a bit of both. Let me first, however, go through the issues. At the moment, the issues are stuck, the, the negotiations, sorry, are stuck on um, a few issues. One is the so-called level playing field. Britain wants unfettered access to the single European market for our exports, of course, but also our supply chains. The EU says, fine, you can have unfettered access without tariffs or regulatory barriers to our market, provided your companies play by the same rules as everybody else in that market, on product standards, on consumer protection rules, on environmental standards, on workplace rights. And the UK government is saying, no, we're a sovereign country. Now we decide our own rules on that. But the EU is not going to allow Britain to compete in its market. And remember, for us, that market's very important because half of our trade is with that market. It's not going to allow us to compete in that same market by undercutting their standards on all these things. So that's the first sticking point in the negotiations. A second one is of minor importance in overall economic terms, but politically is very sensitive, is fishing. Um, the EU wants to continue to have the rights to fish for its fishermen, fish, fishers in EU in UK waters. The UK is saying, no, these are now our waters. We'll control access to it. But actually, if you know a little bit about fishing, the issue is not so much where you fish, it's how you share out the common stocks of fish, which have the unfortunate habit of swimming from one country's waters to another, if you're going to avoid overfishing, you have to reach joint agreement on that, as we've done for donkey's years within the EU and in the negotiations between the EU and Norway, the EU and Iceland, and so on. If we're opting out of that system and saying, we're going to unilaterally set how much can be fished in our waters, that really doesn't work from the EU viewpoint. You're going to fish as much as you like, and the rest of us have to conserve fish and limit by quotas how much you can fish to preserve so stocks. That doesn't work. The leverage they have over us, over the UK, is that nearly 80% of what we catch, British fishers catch, is actually exported mostly to the EU. 
So they can say, right, if you don't want to deal on fishing, we just don't take your fish anymore. So it's, it's a tricky issue from the UK government point of view, given that they want to rah, rah, reassert our sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. Third issue is enforcement of whatever is agreed. It had been ag provisionally agreed that whatever is enforced, there's a, a joint committee to settle disputes, it can go to arbitration panels, but whenever the dispute hinges on the interpretation of existing EU legislation, it's the European Court of Justice, which of course interprets EU legislation. Other matters, no. That was agreed before the negotiation started in, as part of the political declaration that was attached to the withdrawal agreement, which sets out what both sides had agreed to negotiate for the future relationship. The UK government's rowing back from that, doesn't want to accept that. Um, and this aspect of the UK reneging on what the UK government, not, let's not tar the whole country with the same rush, but the government reneging on what it had previously agreed has become a big issue. Two reasons. One is the Northern Ireland Protocol, which was part of the withdrawal agreement, is binding already in international law. And as I'm sure you, most of you know, the UK's internal market bill gives the government the right to derogate from that agreement. So the UK breaking international law. That's not gone down very well, to put it mildly, not just within the EU, but more widely internationally. The second thing the, U the UK government is reneging on is precisely what was agreed in the political declaration attached to the withdrawal agreement, ratified by the British Parliament and by the European Parliament, setting out what both sides agreed to negotiate for the future relationship. That included provisions on a level playing field, for instance, and the on consumer protection, environmental standards, those things I mentioned earlier. And the fact that the British government doesn't want to stick to what it had agreed to as the basis of the negotiations, that also has caused consternation across, across the rest of Europe, as, as you can imagine. And then finally, there's, there's not much news from the negotiations on the non-economic side. What about Britain's access to European research programmes? What about Britain's access to student exchange schemes, Erasmus and so on? What about our access to police cooperation, Europol, European arrest warrants and so on? What about our access to the or our continued participation in the European health insurance card schemes so that whenever you travel in the EU, you're covered without paying extra health insurance, whether it's for holiday or for business? Um, what about the technical agencies, the medicines agency, the air safety agency, the, and, and the chemical agency, which was so important for British business? We're opting out of that, it, it would appear. What are we going to do? Set up our own agencies at great expense, duplicating what we have done jointly to save money. Set up our own agencies, try and have them recognised across the planet by other countries at short notice, recruit staff at short notice. Or do we say to the EU, oh, sorry, we're leaving. Could, could we still stay in this agency, please? Will you have us? The government's been totally silent on that. So there's a, a lot of imponderables still at this very late stage, well after all the deadlines that have been initially agreed. So either we're heading for no deal or we're heading for a bad deal. That's the way I would summarize it at the moment. And a bad deal is, is what you could call a sort of minimalist deal, a skeleton deal. But why is it bad? Because it will keep us outside the customs union. The government's clear about that. So a customs barrier between us and our main trading partners. Even if we agree zero tariffs, that's a technical border because you have to check goods, rules of origin, verify them, etc., to see if they're eligible for export if you're outside the customs union. Outside the single market, which after all is a common set of rules 
that we apply, which means that at the moment, every product in Britain is legally sellable across the whole of Europe. If we're outside that system, you have to prove that your product meets their standards and, and, and safe, safety and health and safety arrangements at the border or beforehand with bureaucracy. So outside of that, outside of the things I mentioned earlier, um, arrest warrants, research, etc. It's going to be a, if there is a deal, it's going to be a bad deal. Which one it is, we don't know. It will hang hinge less, I think, on the content of the negotiations than on the balance of power within the Conservative Party. On the right wing of the Conservative Party, there are many who do not want a deal at all. First, it's the nationalist, populist, um, sovereignist rights. Why should we be tied? We want unfettered rights to make our own rules. We don't like these foreigners and Europeans anyway. But it's also the neoliberal right. The neoliberal rights of the Conservative Party are wary of any deal because they think a deal will, to a degree, keep us tied to European standards, European protections on consume, for consumers in of the environment and workplace rights and so on. The very reason they wanted Brexit in the first place was to escape those standards. They want a free-for-all market where corporations can do what they want and Britain can compete on the basis of lower standards. Many of them want to realign Britain away from European standards, which are quite high, to America, also for geopolitical reasons, but to American standards, lower, lower food safety protection, for instance. That's what they wanted Brexit for in the first place. So they're wary of any deal. They want, they prefer no deal. So those elements of the Conservative Party want no deal. Others in the Conservative Party, those who are traditionally close to industry and so on, who are now weaker than they used to be in the Conservative Party, see the problems, see that the no deal Brexit is costly and damaging for the British economy. They want a deal. Which way will Johnson pivot? I think that's the central question rather than how are the negotiations going? It's which way is he going to pivot in terms of keeping control of his own party? And of course, we know that to gain leadership of his own party, he relied on the right wing, the eurosceptic neoliberal right and nationalist right. I really don't necessarily see him pivoting. That's why we're going to get either no deal at all or a very skeleton minimalist deal. And what should we do? Those of us who are, as I think most people on this call are, if not everybody who are pro-Europeans, I think we need to call it out. We need to say this deal is, is not what was promised, by no means what was promised in that referendum campaign when they said it would be easy, it would save lots of money, that would go to the, all go to the NHS, it would be good for Britain and its economy. All of those things, the opposite is true. It's not what was promised. It's costly, it's damaging, it's reducing our access, it's reducing our rights. We shouldn't hesitate to call that out, because I think it's very important, ultimately, to discredit the whole Brexit exercise, to show that it was a mistake, it's bad for our country, it's damaging, and that might prepare the ground in due course, either for a closer relationship with the European Union, and who knows, maybe to campaign one day to rejoin the European Union. There's no contradiction in that, rubbishing the Brexit deal showing that any Brexit bears no resemblance to what was promised is something we should all do. Thank you very much.